This week's episode of The Grid is sponsored by Impix, shoot today, upload tonight, we ship tomorrow. Manfrotto, imagine more. On One Software, software that gets you back to shooting. Adorama, more than a camera store. Tiffin, helping create the world's greatest images. Peach Pit Press, publishers of technology books, ebooks, and videos for creative people. Epson, exceed your vision. Expo Imaging, rogue flashbenders for speedlight enthusiasts. Nick Software, photography first. And B&H Photo, the professional source. Okay. <laughs> well, hello everybody and welcome back to another live episode of The Grid. My name is Mac Laskowski and I'm joined today by Mr. R.C. Concepcion. What's going on everybody? How you doing? How you doing? I'm, d- I'm doing good. Good. Long time no see. I know. It's been like, what, 20 minutes? A couple minutes. We had lunch together, so. <laughs> uh, we also have a very special guest uh, on air. He's not at the studio with us today, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see him. I know we can hear him. Jeremy Cower. How's it going, Jeremy? Good man, how are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing good. How about, as uh, so, hold on, I got you. You came up on screen for a second, and then you went away. I was looking at your uh, your cool digs b- yeah. behind you there. Yeah, it's just it's just actually our monitor. We actually have this big square monitor that apparently works everywhere else, with the <laughs> exception of right in front of us when we're doing this show. You, you did look really cool for a second, though, Jeremy. So. <laughs> I'm sure everybody else can see you. We just can't. So, uh, anyway, so so we're gonna do something a little bit different this week. We're we're gonna dive right into our topic. Okay, our topic is, and and I'll give credit to RC on this one because we were talking this morning about some some possible topics for the show. Uh, our topic this week is when inspiration fails you. All right, so when inspiration fails you as a photographer. Um, you know, how does it happen? Why does it happen? What do you do? RC, since, since you kind of spearheaded the topic this morning, so I'll let you kind of kick it off. Yeah, I think the, the origin of it came a lot from we uh, looking at a lot of stuff on Google+, right? I spent a lot of time on Google+, and interacting and commenting and things like that. And there was a post by somebody who came out and said something to the effect of, I'm, I'm do, using my camera, I'm picking up the camera, and at one point or another camera, the entire process of photography is mm-hmm. becoming hard or it's becoming more like work. And when it becomes like work, I need to kind of back up and take a break from it, which I thought was a sensible enough concept. But then I think that what happened is in the middle of all of that stuff, it, it got into this entire thing about, you know, not feeling inspired, not feeling inspired, not yeah. feeling inspired. And how do you get your mojo back when you don't feel inspired of this? And uh, Kelly Seeger Kim and Karen Hutton and Tamara Prisoner and all these other people were having this. They have this show on Google Plus called Life Through the Lens, and they explored a little bit of the topic behind it of ways to be able to get your photographic inspiration back. And I'm watching this show, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I kind of agree with what they're saying, but I, I hold a very, very different view about this. And I usually, do to, I usually think to myself, inspiration, I can't, I don't count, I like inspiration, I think inspiration is good, but I don't count on it. Yeah, you can't, you can't just sit there and depend on it hitting you at some point. Yeah, it's like, you know, and, and it's one of those things where I'm just like, if, if I, there's times that I love picking up a camera, and there's times that I have to pick up a camera. And when I have to pick up a camera, that's just as important as, you know, when, when I love to pick up a camera. I don't sit around and go, well, I need to be inspired to be able to mm-hmm. do it. Yeah. Because I think that, that sets, it sets up a really, really bad precedent for yourself. And I think that there's a whole bunch of different bad precedents that are there where sometimes I think people check out of the conversation. They're like, I'm not inspired. I'm not going to do it. It's like, well, dude, you'd be surprised as to how many photographers aren't inspired about doing this and yet still wrestle back into it yeah so and that's what i wanted to talk about and i wanted to talk about it with probably one of the people who personally for me is probably one of the most inspiring people out there and that's uh that's you jeremy on that it's you're an individual who who i think epitomizes beautiful photography and very very inspirational photography and and also if i can jump in also a very diverse very diverse photography Mm -hmm. you know i mean i mean you know, it, it, it looks like, it, it, and just just from the outside, it looks like to to me, Jeremy, inspiration hits you all day long, every day, nonstop. Because when you look at your work, th- there's so many different aspects to to your work. So to me, it looks like you're being bombarded with inspiration. But I'm sure on your side, the feeling is actually very different. 
Um, yeah, it's it's a very interesting topic that I'm glad y'all are uh, glad y'all are discussing. I think it's important to cover. Um, I, I would actually agree that I mean I do stay very uh, I do stay very inspired. Um, I'm I'm generally a very happy person. I've got uh, an amazing family. Um, you know I love love what I do. I love creating, um, but I do also do have a lot of days where I'm not inspired, uh, uh, and especially in terms of um, commercial shoots. You know a lot of times we end up shooting things that we're not. Uh, if we're being honest, we're not super excited about, you know, there's a lot of commercial gigs that I do, a lot of bands that I shoot that I could care less about their music <laughs> and I care less about, you know, maybe what they're doing. Um, but it's my job. Yeah. to, d to dig deep and to, to figure it out and, and to pull, to pull in inspiration on those mornings when you've got a headache, you didn't sleep last night, you know, uh, it's just a rough day and you have to be a magician and make it happen. And so I almost think it's two different conversations conversations in terms of being inspired to shoot personal work and to keep growing your portfolio versus inspiration when it comes in terms of an actual gig and you have to find it. And so um, I guess what I'm saying is that like there's two different yeah. conversations. And, and, and you know, to, to jump in, part of what when RC started uh, talking about this this morning, one of the first things that I said to him was like, you know, well, you know, we're in some ways it seems like we're almost talking about this as if you know photography is your job and and you need to be inspired all the time and i said to arcia said what about people who this is just a it's a passionate hobby for mm -hmm. you know they're not out there making money every day from it but they love photography but they still lose inspiration i mean it still happens whether you're out there making money from it or not you're still faced with this inspiration gain or loss that, that we see every day. But we had a kind of a good conversation about that. Yeah, this and, and, and that was the thing. It was just, and I, and I always preface it because I always come from, I always come from an overly militaristic view of <laughs> photography. I can attest to that. It, it's just like at the end of the day. Did you I, say overly I, militaristic in just photography? <laughs> I'm just overly militaristic <laughs> in a lot of different things. Um, but my thing with the entire, the okay, the best way to be able to think about it was there's a guy named Chuck Close. Chuck Close is an artist. He wrote this, uh, he was interviewed in this book by a guy named Andrew Zuckerman, a, a book called Wisdom, where they did these portraits and they did all of these movies that talked to individuals about the value of wisdom and what wisdom means to an individual. And Chuck Close probably had the most inspiring to me quotes about this entire process. And he said, inspiration is for amateurs. He's like, if you sit around and just wait for the clouds to part in order for you to get something, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to get anything. And he's like, I show up to work. And a lot of the times I think people tend to look at this and they, they go, all right, well, I'm just, a, I'm just a hobbyist photographer. I don't really need any of this stuff. Um, so that doesn't apply to me. But I'm like, you, you, you're a passionate photographer. You should be a passionate photographer. Therefore, when you look at this stuff, if all of a sudden you turn around and the moment that it's not inspiring, you're like, oh, I'm done. I'm out. Then you're like, well, how passionate are you about what it is that you want to do? Yeah. And I think that to some degree, sometimes that only means that you kind of want to do it. You kind of want to take pictures. You kind of want to post them. You kind of want people to plus one them and like them. Yeah. But the moment that the, that the going gets tough, you just want to bounce and you just want to go do something else. And I'm not saying that that's what the original poster on Google Plus said, nor am I saying that, that, that other people are genuinely feeling that way, but I'm saying that's the one thing that we need to, as photographers, avoid. And, we, and the best way for us to be able to avoid that is to understand that inspiration isn't the source for why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to want to do yeah. it, but it's not the source for it. Hey, hey, Jeremy, you, can, uh, you can't see our comments, but w we just got a comment in that, uh, from Andy. And to me, it, 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 brings a, it brings up a thought that, that RC was just talking about. No, it says, nothing sucks inspiration like cube walls. So you know, let's, let's say we take the, the enthusiastic hobbyist photographer uh, first in this, in this circumstance. Okay. So I would argue, I'd argue this, this inspiration topic is actually, some, in, in many ways, even more applicable to them. Because when, when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you're enthusiastic about something, mm -hmm. uh, let's say blogging, mm -hmm. and you say, hey, I'm going to start a blog. You know what? I guarantee you, your first two weeks of that blog are going to be kick-ass. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have great posts and everything like that. It's two months into it. 
six months into it, 12 months into it, that things are going to start getting hard. And I think the same thing holds true for photography. When you first pick up your camera, you're going to be incredibly inspired to go out and to start shooting all these different things. And then two months will go by and six months will go by and eight months will go by. And then that, that's where the well runs dry. And if we're talking about that enthusiastic hobbyist type of a person, chances are, it goes back to the comment, you're surrounded by cue balls every day. Mm -hmm. You know, so so what what do you do to to go get that inspiration? You know, what what, what are some things that that can help? Um, so that one eight months down the line, you know, you you really love photography, but you just don't feel inspired to do anything with it. Right now, Jeremy, just to throw it just to throw it back to you, um, let's just let's just say on average, and and it's probably hard to say because I mean obviously it's going to depend on what you're doing, how you're doing it. Would you say that you run into being uninspired? Some of the time, most of the time, all of the time, just just picking up the camera, looking in front of it, and just going, "All right, I'm, I'm waiting for it." How much do you th how much do you rely on your camera to be the end of your inspiration? Gosh, that's a uh, a great question. I mean, I'll go back to the commercial versus personal argument. When I'm shooting commercial gigs, uh, the inspiration is usually not there. Um, for the reasons I mentioned before, and so yeah. uh, I'd say I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the time, the inspiration is not there. It's rare that I get uh, a commercial assignment that I am just outrageously passionate about. And usually, when when I do get those assignments, it's an artist or it's something that I already was a fan of. And so, for me to collaborate with, say, Image and Heap, or when I shot Sting or some of these other people I've worked with, that I'm already a Oh, it looks like we may have lost him a little bit. We may have lost the signal. For Come that. back to us, Jeremy. But you know what? I think that that's actually very, just while we're waiting for him, because I think that we just had a little bit of a problem there. Um, but while we're waiting for him, I think that that's actually very telling. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, everybody loves Jeremy Coward, right? I'm a big fan of Jeremy yeah. Coward. I think Jeremy Coward does a great job of most of this stuff. Jeremy loves Jeremy Coward. Jeremy loves Jeremy Coward. But... To all of a sudden to see the track of all of his work and turn around and go, that's actually produced by not a lot of inspiration, at least in the commercial project yeah. side of it. Well, if that's happening, then then what is the regular person who's not doing the commercial projects that's, that's doing the hobbies and all that stuff? Ta-da, surprise. Guess what? He's not doing this stuff yeah. out of inspiration. It, it might have been inspiration, but it was just somebody else's inspiration. Right. It wasn't his. It's work. And, and how does that happen? And, and how do you overcome that? Or how do you work with this? I'll Let's tell you what. Why don't we, uh, why don't we do this? Okay. Because uh, we're, we're trying to get Jeremy back on, but we are due for a break anyway. So we're going to take a very quick break. Before that break, we do have to say a very quick hi to, to our French counterpart over there who is not French at all today. Mr. Pete Collins, what's going on, Pete? How are you? I know I am totally non-French. I was going to, I was trying, my, my order for the French women's beach volleyball bikini didn't come in yet. And so we're I just, very if, sad if, about if, that, if I by the way. If I wear that, I wasn't going to wear anything that, you know, just. You don't want to wear anything too revealing. I know, I know. And so, <laughs> guys, we do know that there's some funky stuff going on with the live chat. If you open it up and it's got the dark background, Click over, open chat in a new window, it'll be better. You'll have to swing that off of your, your normal tab and, and look at it side by side, but that will be easier to read, and we're working on it. Sorry about that. Anyway, guys, how's it going? I'm just over here trying to All right, man. fix things for Hold you, down but the I'm fort. here for you. Hold down the fort. No bikini, but I'm here for oh, you. Oh, we got Jeremy back. Jeremy, we're going to uh, take a very quick break, and we'll be back with more right after that. All right, sounds good.
can't wait to do this again. Everybody, welcome back to the Grid Live, and uh, we just had a commercial um, from from one of our sponsors, which is Mpix, and uh, I, I I wanted to let you guys know that in two days they have a contest that's ending, and it's a free contest to enter. It's called Hit My House, and uh, it, it's all about getting photos on your wall. So right. if there's anything to take, because because this is what I learned from this, you did you did a video on Scott's blog mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago, and. What was funny was all the comments on the video were, were like, that's my house. Yep. I'm a photographer, but that's what my house looks like. And it was a big empty wall. Yeah, yeah check this out. So it was, it was here at scottkelby.com. If you go to July 9th, it's called the effects of printing and hanging. And I was just talking a little bit about my, my walls. And, and actually, you know what? Why don't we just do this? Why don't we just play the video? the video? Take a look at the video real quick. Uh, we'll co you know, you see what I'm talking about. Hey everybody, RC here. I have a confession to make. I'm a photographer. I spend all my time taking pictures, but you know where those pictures don't end up? My walls. <laughs> I don't do anything with them. We bought this house in December and there isn't that many prints up here and you know what? It doesn't feel like home yet. Now, Mpix has a contest that's going to help you with exactly that same problem. Go to mpix.com forward slash hip my house. You put in your email address and one of you guys is going to win a $5,000 shopping spree where you can get your entire house done up by Mpix. Now, I don't qualify, so I actually had to go and bite the bullet and order a series of prints from Mpix. I had my buddy Rich come in and mark some spots, and then I had my buddy Pete come in here, and little by little we were able to put all of these pictures up, and now all my photography is up on my walls. And that's the cool part about it. When I take all my pictures and I put them up there, it does make my house feel a lot like a home. And it can with you too. Make sure you check out mpix.com forward slash hip my house. Maybe you can win $5,000 to be able to do this to your home. Take care. We are back once again, but that, that was a very cool video. And if you look at the comments that were on that blog post, they all echoed the I same do. thing. Here's the a same bunch thing. of photographers saying, I don't have anything on my walls. And, and as I look through my house, I have some walls with some stuff on, but by no means I have some, some big empty walls in my house. So I actually did change. I'm gonna do a quick blog post tomorrow about unpackaging some MPEX prints, just because I don't think people realize how these things come packaged. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I went and I got some stuff. Uh, so I've, I've, I've pimped my walls as well. <laughs> but anyway, check out the contest and uh, mpix.com slash hip my hip house. My house is, H-I-P, uh, my house. Yeah, it's got like two more days left. It's free to enter. So. Now, Jeremy, you're still with us, right? I am. Because I think okay. that that was a dun-dun-dun kind of moment that we had there. Inspiration. Yeah. Everybody looks at your work. Everybody looks at your commercial work. And you're saying that of that work, you, you don't really walk into it completely inspired. No, no, not at all. It's a, it's a matter of, uh, you know, I, I love that you were quoting Chuck Close because I think another one of his quotes, I could be wrong, but I think it was Chuck Close that said, you know, creativity is what I do from nine to five. And uh, I think that's really appropriate because it's like we just have to show up and get it done. You know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter whether we're inspired or not. <laughs> and I feel like my, a lot of my that's commercial good. work is that way. I just have to show up and turn on that, that thing, whether I'm feeling it or not. And uh, thankfully, it works most of the time. There are, cert there are some shoots that just no matter what you're doing, man, you're not, you're not doing a good job. You know, that happens to, to all of us, so, I think. So, so do, do you have an example of some time where that happened? Where, where it's just, it, it's, I mean, the end result was, was, was fine. But, like, you know, what happened? Like, what happened and how'd you, how'd you bring yourself out of it? Well, I think it can be a number of things. I mean, it can be, it can be a, a bad location that you really thought was amazing based on the location scout pictures, and then you show up and it's actually terrible. So then you're uninspired, or it can be the subject isn't giving you anything. I could name a very, very famous celebrity that I recently worked with, but I'll, I'll refrain from naming her name. But uh, she just, <laughs> she, I could tell halfway through the shoot that she was miserable and she could care less about these photos that show her this amazing image and she'd be like yeah whatever and uh 
So finally, I asked her manager, I said, is she always, am I, does she hate me? Like, what is wrong right now? Because it was really yeah. firing back at me as well. I wasn't inspired whatsoever. And finally, they were like, oh, no, 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 no. She, she loves to shoot. This is how she always is. She reacts this way with <laughs> as well. She just hates photo shoots, but, but you're doing a great job. So keep going. And uh, so from that point, I was inspired, but it, you know, a lot of times it really can be the way your subject uh, get feeds back to you. And so, um, and then sometimes it's like, no matter how hard you try, you just can't get the lighting right. And you're just having an off day on with light. So I really feel like it can be a number of things. Sometimes I have really annoying assistants, you know, sometimes the crew can be, can factor into that. I mean, for the most part, I have really great assistants. Yeah. Uh, the times of me having a bad crew is very, very rare. But uh, all that to say, it can be a number of factors. So, way that inspiration. So could it could it ever be uh, where you're at this emporium and it's like 10 degrees below zero and it's snowing that's outside? <laughs> <laughs> Could it ever be that? <laughs> so that's just the. W w I was at a, one of the classes that Jeremy did for KelbyTraining.com. He he shot he shot a band like we we filmed Jeremy doing a, a whole band shoot, and man, it was cold as heck. It was snowing outside, and this place had yeah. no heat inside of it, and and we were just shivering the whole day. So so the so the 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 genesis of all of this stuff is that because there's a lot of you guys that could be watching this stuff, and you turn around, and you go, all right, well. Jeremy has to go out or we have to go out or we do all of these kinds of things where you walk into an environment where the environment is less than perfect and the environment isn't giving anything to you and the subject isn't giving anything to you. Where do you go to get, you know, to dig deep to be able to bring this? The immediate thing I think that sometimes happens here is that we're going to go, well, that doesn't necessarily apply to me. I'm not a commercial photographer or I'm not a person who's making a living doing photography. I'm a hobbyist that's working with this. But I think that the important part about this is that the lessons for that, what, what applies to somebody who's very, very inspirational and does this kind of stuff can be stuff that can apply to you. This is the one example that I was giving people from a inspiration point of view. I, 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 I made a couple of general statements. One. Expecting that every single time that you shoot, you publish, or, or expecting that every single time that you take a picture, mm -hmm. that you immediately have to go and share it with Facebook, share it with the world, share it with Twitter, that expectation is probably one of the surefire ways to damn anything that you're doing photographically. Yeah, good. You're almost kind of doing it for the wrong reason in some ways, too. Jeremy, what do you think about that? Do you, I mean, when you go out to a shoot, do you go, all right, this one's going up on Facebook, this is when, do you ever go to a shoot and just go, you know what, I'm going to sit on this for a little bit? Oh, there, well, first of all, it's, it's hard to compare commercial shoots because a lot of times you're not allowed to share it anyway for a very long time until they release it. However, uh, I really don't uh, show a lot of my work because I'm just not... I'm not proud of all my work, you know, and I don't kill everything. In fact, I've had a lot of subjects say, well, why aren't I on your website? Why aren't I on Jeremy.com? <laughs> I say, well, you know, the only stuff that goes on my website is stuff that I feel is really me and is really unique uh, and is really fits my portfolio and adds something to my portfolio. Um, and not every shoot is going to do that. And so, um, you know, hopefully they understand that. They don't always. But. That's a tough question, though. <laughs> That's a really yeah. tough question. How it's actually not me. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> so right. I, I got to ask you guys this, because I, I, I think this ties into inspiration. And I see a lot of people do this every year. And we, we always see it happen in the beginning of January. Do you think the photo a day projects help people? Or hurt people? Jeremy, I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. I like that question. Um, if you need a second, I'll give you my opinion. But. <laughs> like I, already, I haven't heard RC's opinion on this, but I can guess. My first response is I think it's a good exercise personally. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing to show all that work because all that work isn't going to be that strong. And so... But yeah, I mean, the idea of exercising creative, our creative muscles, our creative thinking every day, I think is good in theory. And I know a lot of people that have done it and it seems to have helped them. Um, uh, I wish I could do that. I certainly don't have the time, but um, 
But yeah, yeah I, don't, I certainly don't think you should show all that work. I, I, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to let RC fire into this in a second. And, uh, and, and see, I, I, cause I kind of, I, I echo, J Jeremy actually said it much better than I ever could have, um, because I've never really cared for the photo day projects, but, but what I, what I do agree with, and I think it was Jay Maisel where I first heard this, um, where he said, you know, uh, you know, the Olympics are going on, so it's so swimming comes to mind. You know, you don't get good at swimming from going out every couple of weeks and practicing swimming. You don't get good at golf from going out every two or three weeks at the driving range and practicing golf. And it's the same thing with photography. You, you know, don't expect to get good at it if you're going to go do it every three to four weeks. It's, it's the kind, you know, it's, a, it's it sounds silly, practice makes, makes perfect. But so I like that aspect of the photo a day. What I don't very, like and what- Very nice, very nice analogy. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. But what I, what I don't like is exactly what you said. I don't think you should post all of them. And I've seen people, I see them on Google Plus, I see them all over the place and they're posting the photo a day. And, and what it does, it, it, it's good to get out there and shoot, but sometimes, you just may not take a good photo that day. I'm gonna say this because I think that I can say this. I'm in a position where I can say this. I usually call the photography the 365 projects, like a fat guy doing jumping jacks. <laughs> That's what I call it. I'm like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a chubby guy. Guess what? The last thing that you wanna see me doing is jumping jacks in front of you. It's just a giant train wreck of everything moving everywhere. Yeah. Every now and again, you'll get good form but for the most part, you're just watching that. And what <laughs> happens, <laughs> what happens is this. At the end of the day, if, if I were to do that for a whole year, I'm gonna look awesome at the end of it. But no one wants to watch the stuff in the middle. So but I'm watching all of this and I, I look at people's, I look at, I look at people's photography at, at 365s and I see some really good things happen here and some really good things happen there. But what happens is in the middle of it, you see a lot of mess because what happens is people pick up the camera and go, oh, I gotta go do my picture. Where, what, where, what? That where, what produces nothing that you're gonna be able to sit back on. So. Visually, if you're trying to control what it is that you want to do, your passion and all of that kind of stuff, it puts you in a position where you're just not showing the best work. So if you have a whole bunch of tens and then you have a whole bunch of threes in the middle of that, all of that stuff gets averaged out and you just become that guy's like, eh, well, he's all right. See, and that's what I was gonna say. He's is pretty good. Is, you know, your jumping jack analogy is good in a way, but at the end of the year, you look good. At the end of a 365 project, oh. You could arguably look really bad because people just saw 325 really bad photos. Right. But, but I think I, 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 I do I do like seeing sometimes there there are there are exceptions to the rule. Um, there I've seen a few projects that are rad. I just uh, skyped you guys a link to a video where a guy did a um, a self portrait every day, and I think self portraits can be kind of interesting, especially if they're all different. But I'd love for you all guys, for you guys to share this link somehow that I just sent you, because it's a really powerful video of a guy documenting his life every day, and he ends up getting, uh, I think it was cancer or some kind of disease, and then his self portraits go through the process of him going to the hospital and all this stuff. It's really, really powerful. Yeah, I'd like fact, to see that. Yeah, in that's fact, it, it'll, it'll make you tear up. But I, I think in terms of like, fam, when it comes to family, like I know that I would be, I would love to be documenting my children every day, one portrait a day. I think stuff like that can be really healthy I, and really, um, really absolutely. powerful. But I agree with RC. If you're walking out of the building every day and going, oh, where's the next bird? Where's the next brick wall? Where's the next train track? <laughs> I feel like it's really uninspired thinking. But yeah. if you're doing something that you're passionate about on a daily basis, like your kids or, or self-portraits or your family or something along those lines, then I think it's a really healthy, healthy thing to do. See, and I think that, and I think that that's, that's a great point for you to differentiate how to be able to take something like a 365 and turn it into something that you can you know, work with, you know, doing a portrait, doing a series and things like that. I shoot a lot. I carry my camera with me a lot. I carry my iPhone now with me a lot and I shoot a lot. I don't share a lot because at the end of the day, 
those, I look at me shooting all the time, grabbing my camera, doing, I see that as the equivalent of jumping jacks. I see that as the equivalent of, I'm just trying to keep in shape, just trying to keep in shape to, to work the mind in a whole bunch of different things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but nobody knows about it. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, only the pictures that I show are the pictures that I'm really, really uh, happy with. And I think that brings me to the next point that I had with not so much the 365, but the shoot and the sharing. I think it's important for everybody who does photography to understand that there is a very, that it is completely okay for you not to show a picture if you don't have it. If you don't have it, and I think, Jeremy, you touched to this uh, very, very well, and that's, a, and that's a very bold move to make, to go out and actually say, hey, guess what? I shot this, I invested all this time in a shoot, I invested all this time in all of these different things, but nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. And when somebody turns around and goes, hey, I know that you went up to, uh, you know, you went up to Colorado to do a shoot, did you get anything? That it's completely okay as a photographer for you to turn around and go, no. Yeah. No, I didn't. I, I wanted to, I had all the intentions to be able to do so, but guess what, it wasn't there. I didn't have the right lens, I didn't have the right environment. The, the, how many times did you drive down to California? Oh God. How many hours <laughs> did you drive to go down? Uh, it's, what's it, it's two and a half hours. Two and a half hours one way, and two, and two and a half hours, hours back. back. How many pictures did you get out of it? None. Okay, did you do it a second time? I've done it three times. How many pictures have you gotten so far? 70.75% of one, like three quarters of a picture. And the, guys, I haven't even put it in I my portfolio because I'm, I'm not, not that happy with and, it. And I want to make sure that I'm not, po I'm pointing this out, not so much, I don't want to be discouraging about it, but I just think that sometimes we have a responsibility as public people to make sure that we tell people, guess what? You don't have to. Because there's people that go out there and they start Google Plus websites or they start blogs or they start portfolios and go, I have to, I have to, I have to. And that sets up very unrealistic ex expectations. Yeah. You'd be shocked to find out how many pictures don't go up. Oh, yeah. Mm. So, so when, and what RC's talking about is I've been to San Francisco uh, three times in the past year. Each time I've went there, I always want to go down to, um, like, the Big Sur coast, mm -hmm. uh, the coastline, and, and Carmel, and, and every that whole area. And I just, I love that area. I love coastlines. So me as a photographer, I just... I, I love coastlines, so I like to go shoot them, and it's beautiful. Every time I've been there, it's I've been skunked. It's it's been two of the times that I've been there. It's been literally you can't see thirty feet in front of you. You know there's water out there, and you know there's this gorgeous coastline, but all you see is what what they call the marine layer. Just so you guys know, by the way, the rest of the world calls it fog. You can call it the marine layer if you want to, but we still all call it fog. But anyway, so, but that's all yeah. I've seen, so. Now, there's a ton of comments that, that are yeah, over here. Yeah, we should get through some of these. Uh, hey, can, I, can I say one more thing real quick that, yeah. I, that I think would be a, a good addition to this conversation? I was thinking about, you, you guys both uh, very well know how much I love Pinterest. Um, and I was just sitting here thinking about the differences, like what keeps me inspired on a daily basis. And I was thinking about the differences between Instagram and Pinterest. Instagram, I swear, drains all inspiration out of me because it's all pictures, lazy, clumsy pictures of coffee cups and and lunches and rainbows Jeez. and clouds and and I and I've I've certainly contributed to the cloud shots. You know, everybody goes on an airplane, but I get on Instagram and I'm so drained because there's no there's no real passion. It's all like we're posting because we want more followers and because we feel like we're supposed to. But then I jump over to Pinterest and my goodness, I am so overwhelmed and, and, and blown away by the work that's being created out there. And, and the differences that Pinterest is coming from, you know, all the work that I'm, that I'm pinning and posting there is from people who are slowly creating official masterpieces and official work. And then I go on Instagram where it's all this photo a day stuff, kind of like what you're saying, RC, watching the guy do jumping jacks. And, and you're totally right, because I'm just not inspired by what I see on Pinterest, on Instagram. But what I see on Pinterest literally makes me want to drop everything I'm doing, go in my studio and create something amazing. And that's why I'm a big fan of it. And for any of you watching, if you go to my Pinterest page slash Jeremy Cower, you'll see all these boards of illustrations and paintings and photographers that just 
make me want to cry because they're so good. And so, um, I don't know. I just think that's an interesting yeah. analogy. I think it's too. great. It's a great cool. analogy. It's actually, it, I hadn't even thought about that comparison. I wondered where you were going with the Instagram thing, and I'm like, <laughs> "Thank you. Somebody said it. <laughs> that's uh, that's right. very cool." Dav, so, uh, Dav D, you can't sit around waiting for inspiration. You run more into inspiration when you're working hard at your craft. Yes, I'd agree. Very much so. And and can let's let's do let's get this out of there. And while we're talking about inspiration, I think the gimme. The gimme to all this, and, and I, I know, know so many people out there know it, but if you're not actively doing it, the gimme to all of this is if you want to get inspired, go out and shoot. Do something. Nothing, nothing will get you through your lack of inspiration phase by just doing it, by just getting out there and doing something. Because if you don't, you, you get zero. You, you, get, you get no place. But by just getting out there and shoot, you'll, you'll walk out and you'll come back with nothing. And you'll walk out the next time and you'll come back with nothing. But, uh, but I honestly feel that it sounds silly. The more that you do it, the, 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 the more and the faster you push through that, that phase of non-inspiration. Now, here's, here's another thing. Uh, so I'm going to skip a couple of questions. Let's see. I want to know as a graphic designer, I want to start doing photography. What is the best, best way to go? What is the best way? To and go. to you to go all out on equipment or start simple. Um, now, I, Jeremy, I think that you're probably the best person to qualify about this. I have an opinion on it, but I, I defer to you on that. Cutting edging is asking, do you go out and get a whole bunch of gear all out or do you start simple? This person's a graphic designer. I know you started in graphic design. What'd you do? So the question is, what do, what do you do to get started and to... Stay inspired. Is that the question? Do you, do you go? Do you go by the Hasi and the pro, the pro photos, or do you just take the Rebel and you go out and you start you start doing your job? <laughs> oh man, loaded question. I'll try to be quick. Um, <laughs> well, there's me, and then there's other people that I really respect. My story was, and this is just facts, that when I quit graphic design, I literally went. I'm a, I'm a, I believe in going debt free now, but at the time I took out a $10,000 loan. I bought my first DSLR, my first three lenses. I bought my first three pro photo lights. I bought all the cards. I bit, basically bought everything with that 10 grand that I needed. So yes, I went into debt and I bought all the gear. In hindsight, I'm actually thankful I did because it was amazing to buy my first lights, not knowing anything about them and just <laughs> dive in. However, there are amazing examples of kids out there and people out there who are doing amazing things with nothing. Uh, a few examples. Ryan McGinley oh. is, is a very, very famous photographer, very famous. And the kid is shooting with like an old Context G2. It's an old film point and shoot. No lights, no Photoshop, no nothing. Just simple ideas with a simple camera. And he's, I think, the youngest photographer to ever be displayed in the Smithsonian. So he's the prime example of you don't have to have fancy gear to create amazing work. There's a guy on Instagram, a friend of mine named Christian J. Sweet, as, as I think is an Instagram username. That dude is creating stuff on his iPhone that will melt your mind. I literally just stare every day. He's the one person on Instagram that's inspiring me. Um, he is doing amazing things with his iPhone. And so, you know, those, those two guys are, are people who don't have all the lights, they don't have all the stuff, and they're still executing amazing ideas. And so while I did go and buy all the gear, um, I think plenty of examples that prove that you don't. I, I, think, yeah. I, I think that that's a very, very fair point. It's I, just you can. Well, I was going to say, one, one, of the, one of the advice that I would give to somebody in that position um, I would say chances are this person knows somebody with camera gear. Um, I would say borrow their camera gear until it no longer becomes feasible to do that. You know, borrow their camera gear until until they until they flat out just tell you stop borrowing my camera gear, or until you get to a point where like, hey, I'm going out for a shoot today, and they say, well, no, I'm going out for a shoot too. Sorry, I can't give it to you. But chances are this person knows somebody, borrow some of their gear, go out and shoot. Get used to it. Get used to what you like. Get used to what you don't like. And that way, as you start to save up the money, you'll be able to go to go get your own camera gear. But I wouldn't. I, I I don't know if I would say go out and you know buy everything. Right. But I would say you know and, and you and I. I mean I 
we talked about your, this. I got just I got your your macro sitting on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and our RC, we talked about this two years ago because there was a lens that maybe it was the macro. And mm-hmm. RC was asking me, he's like, yeah, I'm thinking about getting the macro, and I'm like, dude, I, I don't do that much macro work. You know, borrow mine until it be, until it's not feasible to borrow it anymore. So right. I, I think that's advice I'd have for anybody that was starting. Let's just quickly recap so far what it is that we've talked about, what happens when inspiration fails you, what kinds of things you need to know. Generally, so number one, understand that it's going to fail you, right? And I think that that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to kind of lean on Jeremy for this kind of stuff because I think that he's an individual who is very inspirational but doesn't find himself in a lot of situations that are very inspiring more often than not mm-hmm. and can push through it. That's something that happens to everybody. You can get to a spot where know that it's going to happen. Number two, don't put unrealistic expectations for yourself, right? So understand that you don't, once you shoot, you don't have to share. Understand that putting everything out there can often be a detriment to you than it can. They're, They're great exercises, but exercises should not be done in public. This ain't South Beach. Yep. You're not sitting outside doing your jumping jacks. <laughs> Do them at home and become a better photographer for that. The less expectations that you have of that, the better. The other thing that we were just talking about here is, you know, you can, you, an argument could be made either way, simple or big. That's going to entirely depend on your credit limit. The, now, just to go into the gear, one of the things that I usually offer people when you're looking at all of this is... A lot of the times, the other, the other maxim they usually tell people is, there is so much to photography that has nothing to do with this. Oh, God, absolutely. When you're working in photography, this, pushing the finger on the shutter, is the absolute last part of the process. Yep. There, there's, there actually, it's, a, it's actually next to last, because the last part of the process is post-processing. From there, what I usually tell people is, we, we as, a, as a society of photographers, we spend a lot of time turning around and going, if I can't do this, I am uninspired to do it. And I'm like, guys, it has nothing to do with what's in front of you. Yesterday, I posed a question and I said, how many of you guys in this chat room have the ability to grab your camera, put your camera to your eye, and without taking your camera off of your eye, can change every single setting on the camera? From focus points to shutters to different modes to ISOs to wipeout, change everything so that you don't stop doing yeah. this. That in of itself is a technique. And people are like, well, you know, you're learning your gear. It becomes very gear based. That's right. Me. Sorry. That's the idea going off. <laughs> so what happens is a lot of the times I usually tell people, Do you want to switch the, the No, thank you. Um, so when you're looking at this stuff, I turn around and I go, Knowing your gear is absolutely essential. People are like, oh, what does that have to do with photography? When you get, remember that this thing is just a box. It's just a hammer. It's just a tool that stands between you and the idea that you have in your head. The faster you know how to make your tool work, the faster you can get the decisive moment that sits in front of you. There's a person that's walking. There's a person that's jumping over a puddle. And you want to be able to make that shot. You need to have that camera to your eye, and oh, you yeah. should know cold how to make all of these different settings so that you can get to that shot, right? And the decisive moment being a very Brisson kind of, you know, motivation for this thing. So knowing your gear, knowing that I want to take a picture of Matt, who's a, you know, famous kickboxer, but he's only got 10 seconds to be able to do it. Jeremy, when you did Sting, when you did the picture of Sting, how much time did you have to do the picture of Sting? Uh, about two minutes. So, and, and a lot of the people think that it's like, hey, Sting, come please sit down. Sing yeah, this song while out. I set up a light. But the, the, good, the cool part about what you were just saying, too, is if you, when you know all those things, you'll get inspired. Because when you take that photo, you're going really, it, to be like, holy crap, I can do that. Yeah. And then you're going to go and start looking for more things. You're, like this whole new world will open up to you. The camera. It, it, it goes back to the golf analogy. You the know, cameras. What keeps golfers coming back? You know, because you know, most hobbyist golfers suck. And it's that one good shot. Mm-hmm. You, know, you take that one good shot, you're like, hey, I'm not so bad about this. And then you go on for the next three months and suck again. But And that's the thing. It's like the less the camera is in the way, the less, the more you learn about the camera, the less the camera becomes in the way. The camera's just this device that you hold in your hand that realizes that stuff. But it gets to a point. You know who else is really, really good at watching this? McNally. 
You watch Joe McNally, he is talking to you, and in the middle of him talking to you, he's computing 14 different things about what he's doing in that camera. He's, oh yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, he's talking about things. He's looking at everything. So from a photographic standpoint, what have you done, what do you do about your the technical part of your craft? How well do you know your camera? How well do you know your lights? Have you put yourself in a position, if you're a strobist, do you have at least seven different tools or tricks in your bag where you can turn around and go, hey, you know what, when all else fails, do the Joel Grimes. Two in the back, one in the front, strip it, you know you're good. Yeah. Do you have that, you know, bring that light, bring it high camera left, two, you know, minus two in the background, put this plus two, boom, you're out. Do you have a set of those tips? If you don't, what are you doing to get that part of your skills so that when you're presented with the moment, you can go and move? Do you have a good, do you have a good photography post-processing thing? Have you looked, you go to Kelby Training, you look at Calvin Hollywood, you look at Jeremy Cowell, you look at Joe McNally, you look at Matt Kluskowski. Have you looked at any of these things and gone, you know what, I've never really researched a post-processing style. Yeah. You know, there's all of these other things that you can do around the concept of photography that can directly contribute to getting you into your photography faster, a lot faster. Pete, you had a comment. Yeah, well, I wanted to chime in that a lot of times we think inspiration, even some of these questions are like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And to be honest, a lot of us need to take stock of who we are and how we think and what we have to bring to the table. The thing that is gonna inspire us when we realize we have something special, each one of us, to bring to the table, instead of chasing after other things, we should be inspired to go, how can I bring something new that nobody else can? It may be that you have family members or experiences and networks that you can get pictures nobody else can. I think a lot of my inspiration comes when I take time to figure out what I can bring special to the table because I'm not gonna be so inspired if I'm taking the same shot as this guy, but if I have a, all of a sudden I see something in a slightly different way and I can bring something new that, that represents who I am, that just inspires me to, to research more about who I am as well. Inspiration- What if you're a boring person? Well, that means we're probably not a very self-inspective person. We really, to be honest, we spend more time looking out than we do in, and I think that's sometimes when we lose our inspiration is we're so busy comparing with other people. One of my favorite sayings is comparison is a thief of joy. As long as I'm comparing you and, and I wanna be like you, I, I'm losing some of the joy of being who I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I just think we often get wrapped up in if I get the right camera, if I do the right stuff, if I learn this, I'm gonna be inspired. Some of the times it means I need to get quiet with my journal, notebook or something and figure out who I am so that I can tell a story. If I don't have a story to tell, I can't be inspiring to other people. All right, Thank cool. you, Pete. Good thoughts, Pete. All right, so we, uh, we have some <laughs> questions, too, so uh, we should probably get through these because we only have a few minutes left. Sure. Uh, let's see here. Jeremy, uh, inspiration for hobbyist. Shoot something different or differently. Try black and white instead of color. If you shoot landscape, shoot people. Shoot architecture instead of people. Shoot at night. Just get out of your common zone. And, and I think that's good advice for, to, to just experiment a little bit. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. When you're shooting, per uh, I'll throw this one to Jeremy because I think he'd be good. When you're shooting personal projects, how do you find ideas or inspiration on what to shoot? Oh, I think he froze. <laughs> Oh, he may have froze. Jeremy, While we have him frozen. Jeremy, that question has, has him stumped. Has him stumped. He's done. <laughs> now, here's, can I double back on the entire shoot, uh, shoot a different, shoot out of your comfort zone? Yeah. And kind of come to that? Because part of me disagrees a little bit with that. And I'll explain to you why. There's two, there's another, there's another piece of advice, if you will, that I would give you when inspiration fails you, um, which got me thinking about it. And I got to give all credit to this to Pete, actually, because we were talking about this, um, I tend to use a lot of other different mediums, and I know Jeremy does, and I know that you do as well, to get inspired. I, I, I watch a lot of documentaries, I listen to a lot of music, and I try to weave all of those things into what I'm doing photographically. And there was this conversation, it was a TED talk by a lady named Brene Brown, isn't it? Uh, it was Brene Brown, right, Pete? 
Yes. Okay, Brene Brown has these two conversations as she talks about shame and she talks about uh, self-worth and living wholeheartedly. Phenomenal conversations uh, that Brene had about that. I, I was going through, and, I, and I'm very, very open about talking about this. I love doing HDR photography. However, I am just very recently, I was just sick and tired of it. Like I'm sitting there as, I love HDR, I love doing it, I love playing with it, but I'm sitting there and I'm just like, if I have to do another HDR shot, I'm gonna shoot myself in the mouth. <laughs> I really, really am. And it was one of those things where the, I was sitting with Pete and we were talking with uh, Dave Black. We were at a restaurant, we were having dinner, and he was talking to me about it, and he was like, well, you know, obviously you try different things and do different things. He's like, but have you really turned HDR on its head, flipped it around, changed, looked at different angles of it? Have you really explored every ounce of that medium as you can? And it was one of those things where he just dropped the seed in there, and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I have. And I think that sometimes what happens is when we go to a different medium, I think sometimes what will happen is we don't fully invest ourselves into that one spot and and really exercise and play with it and do you know yeah, do different things, things with it. You just you just leave it and you go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's like you only learn the first three bars of Led yeah. Zeppelin and then after that you're off to something else because you haven't fought through That's the a, dip. Ah. That's a great analogy too, the, the guitar analogy, because I can't count how many beginnings of songs I know. So in that, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I was watching the Brene Brown thing. And in the middle of that, I turned around and there was one thing that she said. She was talking about her second talk and she said, I learned something. It was a very basic family thing. You got to dance with the one that brought you. And I sat there and I th said to myself, a lot of people, I do small flash, I do big, I do all these other type of portraits, but I do HDR. And a lot of people know me as HDR. And whether or not I am want to shoot myself in the mouth with it, I owe it to my craft to explore every aspect of it and digging through it, finding people, finding different environments, finding interiors, and kind of combing through it helped, but it came from most non-traditional method. You know, yeah. it didn't come from looking at photography books, working on techniques. It came from listening to a talk, listening to music, having dinner with somebody to talk about that stuff. None of that has to do from any inspirational stuff. Yeah. So Cool, I like that one. Time for a uh, break? Uh, yeah, let's take a quick break and we'll come back. We'll wrap up with a couple more questions. See you back here in just a minute. Hey everybody, we are back with our final segment of The Grid Live. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping uh, housekeeping things here. You can always uh, find the show afterwards over at kelbytv.com slash The Grid. So if mm -hmm. you want to rewatch any part of today or go check out any of the old shows, you can just go to the website, find that out. We also got a, a couple of prizes here. Um, Pete, we have... Two books. Maybe an inspiration books? Kickstarter kit. Yeah, it is an inspiration <laughs> Kickstarter kit. So, so one person will win two books. One of them is Visual Stories with Vincent LaFerre. And the other one is The Moment It Clicks with Joe McNally. Nice. Now, let's get back to, I want to get back to the non-traditional methods. All right. Is there anything that you look at that you see non-photographically that you use as a source of inspiration? Hmm. What the heck do I use for a source of inspiration? <laughs> Jeremy? Where's Jeremy? <laughs> Jeremy's not here anymore. Um, I'd have to give that one some thought. Okay, here's the thing. Have you ever thought to yourself when you're, when you're doing Taekwondo, who apparently he's amazing at, amazing in the world, doing very, very well. Thank you. Do you find yourself looking at Taekwondo and finding yourself photographically inspired by it? Positions or moves or kicks or things like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I... I I, I see that stuff. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to go through and just think about things that inspire me. It, it sounds silly, but 
<laughs> it sounds really silly. So I, I, I love shooting landscapes. Mm -hmm. And I drive home at night and I see the clouds in the sky. Mm -hmm. And I just think, man, if I, if I had this in front of me. So it's like the clouds kind of spur a different, a different type of a view. Of, you know, if I had a beach in front of me, if I had a canyon or whatever, and I start to think about like what setting that would look good on. So I, I think. That's not silly at all. Just, That's actually a very, very insightful way to look at it. How many people would turn around and just look at a whole bunch of clouds and go, all right, I'm looking for an environment now? That, those are very non traditional yeah. sources. Your drive home can serve as an inspiration. You're not, you don't have your hand in front of a camera. You're not doing any of yeah. that stuff. Pete, what about you? Non-traditional sources, is there anything that you look at? Oh, yeah. Well, I think, well, for me, it helps being a, a little ADHD because everything inspires me. It, it's a problem of getting it focused. You know, I'll be driving down the road and I'll be seeing something that will inspire me. Of course, I forget it by the time I get home. But I, I think family, my kids are some of the most inspiring things because they see things and they're unabashed about saying it. They see things with those clear eyes that mm -hmm. I've forgotten, I've become jaded. And so my family, music, TV, I, I get inspired by all kinds of stuff. Nice. So. I, you know what I get inspired with? And I know, and I know that this is, sometimes I, I get, I get uh, teased about it nerd, for, for being a little bit of a nerd on it. I get inspired by old masters. I get inspired by watching old master things. Uh, on YouTube, there's a guy, I'm just going to go ahead and try to see if I can post it here. I'm not going to show it to you, but there is a YouTube channel, this guy right here, called Rangefinder General. And Rangefinder General, if you find this guy on YouTube, he's a great person to talk to. There's three different things that I use for inspiration. Uh, he has a giant show on Alfred Eisenstadt, which I find to be a very, very inspirational photographer. Uh, Ansel Adams, he has another talk. I'll just go ahead and I'll just show you that. These are all on that YouTube channel. Ansel Adams has this giant photography thing here. So this is another chat with him to talk about this stuff. So there's the Ansel Adams Master Photographers. And then this right here by Brisson, a lot of the times, whenever I need to kind of just open my mind and work with different things, I'll listen to how people did it a long, long time ago. Not the film, I spent my time in a studio, yeah. the f working on Fixer. This is just kind of the ethereal concepts of all of this kind of yeah, stuff. Just makes, Plain Love. perfect sense. Just Plain Love by Bresson is probably a, f is a phenomenal, phenomenal thing to just look at, to kind of step back from the mechanics of all of the stuff and look at it from a completely yeah. different angle. So there, those are non-traditional sources. Like I wouldn't go to YouTube to find photographic inspiration, but these guys had information and they talked about things that are very, very timeless. Do you, and so can I jump in with one sure. more thing that, that I thought of? Um, I find inspiration from looking at other people's work. Mm -hmm. I, that 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 is that is my greatest source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Looking at a, if you want to know like th this, and I, it, it took me a second to to kind of formulate it. But every night I sit on my iPad with the 500 PX app, and and I have I have a Flickr I have mm -hmm. a Flickr photo stream, which is sometimes good. So I like the 500 PX one better because I find like I get more quality photos. The Flickr one I kind of have to search through a little bit more. But every night I sit on my iPad with that 500 PX app. And I flip through and I look at the photos. And every once in a while, one stops me and I start to think of how I could take that photo. But that other right there is another thing that a lot of people do not do. Do you think about it? Do you write it down? Yeah, I have a little, I use Evernote. So I, I put everything in Ever. I have, a, I, have a, I have a notebook in Evernote called Photos I Wanna Take. And so I take photos that I wanna take and I put them into that notebook in Evernote. But and do you I, write I, down the whys? Um, do you I don't write down the whys? I don't no, I don't write down the why too much. I'll tell you why. But, well, uh, just to finish the thought. Mm -hmm. um, but don't, I, I think so much, we hear, we hear people say, develop your own style. You have to be you. You have to be, develop a creative style and all this stuff. Forget all that. Look at other people's work who you admire and try to mimic it. Because here, here's what's, one of two things is going to happen. One of three things will happen. A, you'll suck, which we hope doesn't happen. B, you'll mimic it and someone will say, hey, that looks great. Your work looks just like so-and-so. You know, if somebody says, hey, Matt, your work looks, looks just like Joe McNally, woohoo! I'm, you know, I'm okay. And then C, which is I think the most common thing is you, you, will, you will look at their work, you'll try to develop a style similar to that, but something of yours will come through there.
Yeah. There isn't yeah. a guitarist out there that hasn't tried yeah. to do Led Zeppelin, Chuck Berry. <laughs> something, <laughs> Presley. Of your, something of of you will show through that, and I think mm -hmm. that's the most common one. Mm -hmm. Is is you, there? There'll have to be some unique quality in it. You'll make a unique quality, but getting yourself to that point. Look at other people's work. Yeah, and sorry. The, well, I was going to point that out because I was in New York. I was doing the thing with Scott. He was doing a date in New York, which, by the way, we need to be able to point out. Kelby Training Live. Scott's got a whole bunch of dates. You've got a date that's coming up. Right, Kelby Training well, Live. So for you're doing August 14th, you're doing Charlotte. August 14th, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, with the Photoshop for Photographers tour. Right, and then Scott's got a Sacramento one coming up. Right. Um, I've got two Lightroom dates in September. And, so just uh, find all of them yeah. over at Kelby Training. Kelby, dot, uh, Kelby Training Live. KelbyTraining.com and just click on the little live seminar. So thing. Uh, those are there. But anyway, so we were in New York and a guy, a kid, came up to me and he was just like, "How do I work on my photography work?" And I'm like, when was the last time that you took a look at a whole bunch of pictures and not just take a look at them, but for every picture that you have, pull out a sheet of paper and go, this is what I like about this picture. It's bright, it's dark, it's colorful, it has a good use of angle, it doesn't have a good use of angle. And then just keep all of these sheets based on all of these pictures. I was like, in the middle of you having all of these pictures, you can have all of these sheets of paper that show you what you like and what you don't like, and you'll see patterns emerge you'll see that you happen to like vibrant colors, these mm -hmm. kinds of compositions, very, very simple. You can see the style yeah. appear in front of you if you just deconstruct a lot of the stuff. Don't just copy, although copying I think is a great idea. I think it's a great way for you to get started, but putting it on a piece of paper, forgetting about the picture and writing it down, I think lets you kind of see this a little bit mm -hmm. clearer when you're doing this. Let's do a couple more comments before we get out of here. Tim R. Friend recently wrote on Facebook about how all his photo friends are technically excellent and have beautiful models and backgrounds, but they all look the same. There's nothing creative about them. Meanwhile, he pretty much always has an idea first when he sketches out before shooting. I don't know. I don't know if that's just more of a statement, but. Yeah, I think I, so. You know what? Here's the thing. That's. The, all their, they all look the same. There's nothing creative about them. Maybe to him they're not, but maybe to the person that took them okay. there is. I mean, you don't know. Anna, I've heard uh, someone say that there's no such thing as inspiration. It's all sweat and experience that will take the artist forward. I can agree with that. Yeah, I, well, I there, what's that saying? Uh, inspiration is... 99% perspiration. Or no. It's perspiration. Per it's, I think it's Einstein that actually said that. Wasn't it Einstein? I had a quote on perspiration or something like that. 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get inspiration when you start a project, but once you get going on it, the excitement comes, and so does the inspiration. I agree with you, Rich T. Sometimes I have ideas. Anna says, sometimes I have ideas of what to shoot during my sleep or just when I wake up. Wonder how the brain works. I'm posting this comment because Jeremy has talked about the same thing happening to him. That's like a great idea. Put a notebook down. I think that's good. Uh, inspiration comes from, not from I have to, but from a want to. Splash four, that's a great, great quote. Here's a great one, Barb's. Barb's uh, playing HDR2. Ansel Adams said that he only expected to get 12 good shots a year. That totally amazed me initially. Then I realized how true that is, and that's a relief to expect better is overly optimistic for me. So I'm happy with, if I get one, if I get one portfolio shot a, a month, I'm pretty happy. That's it? That's, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm good with that. Now, we, we're running out of time. Uh, Mr. P. Collins, can you go ahead and shut that off so that we can go ahead and take the uh, take the contest? Yep. So now all you got to do is, what do they do, Pete? Well, now that uh, we've turned that off, feel free to send in your name, your email address, and that, uh, well, we've only got one winner today. Are we going to do a Photoshop World ticket as well? Probably not a good thing to ask on air, but no. Yep, yeah, sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> well, guess what? We're only going to do one thing today, and it's going to be for the two books. Those two books are the uh, Visual Stories by Vincent LaFerre, and the other one is A Moment It Clicks with uh, Joe McNally. So make sure you put in your name, your email, and that you would like to win that prize. And you can also just send in a, a wonderful comment that says how great I am and how good a job I am and how glad you are that Nancy will be back. Is she going to be back next week? There's a clamor for Nancy, so hopefully she'll be back next week. Yeah. All right. So cool. let's get, let me just get and recap. Things to be able to do when inspiration fails you. Number one, first thing you need to know, you need to understand that inspiration will fail you. Right? Don't rely on inspiration. It's going to fail you. Knowing that, I think, is half the battle. The second thing is understand that just because you shot it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to share it. Keeping back and just not sharing everything will actually help you in the long run. Number three, 
overly shooting something and overly sharing something, like Ono Studio said, does this lead to the question, do we overshare? Absolutely. That's, that's what I think is a large part of this problem. Understand that you don't have to share. Just because Google Plus is there doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put a picture. Only share what you absolutely believe is going to be good. Other than that, keep your jumping jacks at home, in my opinion. <laughs> Number four, what have you done with your technical ability to be able to make sure that the camera is the last thing that gets in the way of the picture, right? The faster you can get to the essence of what you're trying to shoot, the better. What do you know about post-processing? What do you know about Photoshop? What do you know about camera work? What do you know about lights? What have you done in any of those respects to cut down the amount of time that it takes you to get to the moment it clicks, right? Number five, non-traditional sources. Use non-traditional sources, yep. right? Find things like talks, like music, like painting, like art to be able to bring you into a different idea. Number six, copy inspire make a list find inspiration yeah. tag it write it down bag it put it in a notebook so that you can see the patterns emerge in the middle of all of that stuff and yeah, lastly that's a good one. understand that this takes time at the end of the day you're going to become a better photographer if you follow all of these things you will become a better photographer but it's not going to happen immediately ansel adams wanted 12 pictures a year we shoot 12 pictures in two weeks <laughs> if you follow Google Plus. Yeah. Right? So 12 pictures a year, 12 weeks. Where's the difference? You need to find that good balance. And once you find that balance, you'll be surprised as to how little you'll have to rely on inspiration showing up at your door. I like the Ansel Adams thing. I really like I was, I was thinking maybe it was just me. Like, if I get one photo a month, I'm, I'm good. But All right. I probably, like this year, what are we at? We're in August. This year, I probably have four photos that I've added to my portfolio. Surprising so, enough. So I don't even have one a month yet. Look at that. But anyway. Look at that. All right. Special hey. thanks to Jeremy Coward. Thanks, Jeremy. Sorry we, uh, yeah, it we looks like lost we... you part of there. But uh, Jeremy, as always, always has wonderful things to say. And Could of not course, have been you better. can find him, uh, find more about Jeremy over at jeremycowart.com. He's the man, man. And so are you. <laughs> and you are, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you to everybody for watching. Of course, thanks to our sponsors. Pete. Thank you very much. Just, you were just, useless today. I know I was. Just for the record, promise me, promising that you'll have my love child won't help you win the books, but I appreciate the, uh, the idea. And you know who you, you may are. may want to rethink that promise. <laughs> Meredith, Brad, Juan, Jen of the Control Room, thank you guys so much, and we will see you guys next week on The Grid. This week's episode of The Grid is sponsored by Impix, shoot today, upload tonight, we ship tomorrow. Manfrotto, imagine more. On One Software, software that gets you back to shooting. Adorama, more than a camera store. Tiffin, helping create the world's greatest images. Peach Pit Press, publishers of technology books, eBooks, and videos for creative people. Epson, exceed your vision. Expo Imaging, Rogue Flashbenders for Speedlight Enthusiasts. Nick Software, Photography First. And B&H Photo, the professional source.